Hello, my name is Dr. Gerard Costa, Director of the Center for Autism and Early Childhood Mental Health at Montclair State University. Today's presentation examines the unintended consequences of child protective service intervention and ways to reduce trauma for young children in the child welfare system. Separation and removal of a child from their primary caregivers, even when these caregivers have been harmful, are toxic stressors in the life of an infant and child and can create adverse emotional and neurological changes. Attachment to a parent occurs even when the parent injures a child. Parents who fall short of their obligation to love and protect their child often have had unfavorable lives themselves. Parenting is a relationship, not a skill, and the belief that parenting can be taught the way other skills are taught, like riding a bike or driving a car, is not empirically supported. Parenting is stressful, particularly in the first years of childhood, and when parents are under stress, they act based on their own character, not their knowledge. For both the child and parent, the manner in which intervention occurs can either increase or reduce the adverse consequences of intervention. There are unintended consequences to current practices of intervention and removal that work against the very goals of ensuring security in the child and addressing the parental and familial factors that led to child maltreatment. When intervention is necessary and out-of-home placement is required, we must consider the effects that occur with our intervention. We will begin this presentation with considering starting points about child protective service intervention. We'll discuss some data, remarkable data, on child maltreatment, and then consider the infant and child through the mental health lens and the neurosciences. Always we will consider the unintended consequences of intervention through the eyes of the child and examine some ways to reduce adverse consequences and I will introduce some promising approaches that can reduce the unintended consequences. Starting points. We know that child maltreatment occurs and state intervention is often necessary. But these interventions, as we stated, result in both intended and unintended consequences that require us to examine them carefully. Interventions must acknowledge the importance of attachment relationships even with parents who have been abusive and neglectful. We have learned over the past 20 years an enormous amount about the infant and early childhood neurosciences, and what we have learned is that all development, particularly of the brain, is organized through the nature of those earliest relationships. And as we noted, it is best to think of parenting not as a skill but a and a belief that we can teach parenting, but in fact consider it a relationship. We must consider all the interventions through the eyes of the child and recognize that changes in placement mean changes in relationships. We must preserve as much as possible the child's relationships and recognize that infants and children must not bear the burden of inconvenience and even redress when making plans and decisions about their lives. Finally, we must attend to the needs of all those who care for the child, meaning that both birth and resource families need our thoughtful principled support, and in fact we must attend to the needs of the helpers, including the Child Protective Service staff and even the judicial team. So let me present some data on child maltreatment that may in fact be known to many of you. We know that, in fact, the youngest child is at the greatest risk of maltreatment, and so this graph displays that trend. But what may be surprising is that the single age that is most common as child maltreatment victims is the age from 0 to 11 months. It is the young infant in that first year that is most likely to be maltreated, often neglect, sometimes physical and sexual abuse, and reliably each year, 11 to 12 percent of all victims of, of maltreatment are under the age of one. This means that the early experiences matter, that brain development in those first moments of life and throughout 
are experience and relationship dependent. And early brain, brain circuits form the foundations for higher level abilities. Therefore, brains are co-constructed and sculpted by what happens. They don't unfold on their own. And infant brains are much more likely to form connections than lose them, for good or for bad, meaning that those good things that happen will be biologized and neurologized, but so will the unfavorable events. What's needed is consistent, predictable, regular, attuned, loving care. Taking care of the baby's physical needs is not enough. So let's review the infant brain. What do we know about babies and their brains and relationships? We know that by five months gestation, there are already 80 to 100 billion neurons, nerve cells, that will form the adult cortex and that in the first eight months of life, those connections among those neurons are more quickly formed than they are broken. And development actually requires not only those connections among those neurons, those connections are called synapses, but actually involve loss or pruning of those that are unnecessary or unfavorable. Babies bring so much to the relationships and so much to those who care for them. They are hardwired to know how to communicate and learn. They are biologically designed to form relationships that support regulating all of their emotions and that in turn leads to their own ability to engage in self-control and self-regulation. And they are born with this capacity to convey their needs, desires, pleasures, and what is distressing in many ways. What's also very important to know is that the right side of the brain, most involved in affect, facial expressions, gestures, tone of voice, rhythm of interactions, comes online well before the left brain, which is more language and logic dependent. And in fact, the lower parts of the brain, underneath the top of the brain, the cortex, the subcortex, particularly an organ called the amygdala, is wired and interconnected early in development through the nature of the earliest relationships. What we know is that when children are in predictable, secure relationships, their brains are in fact more efficiently organized. And we know that the baby's brain is more sensitive to those pre-verbal and non-verbal uh, aspects of interpersonal communication, even more important than the words, and that facial expressions, tone of voice, movement and gestures are more powerful than the words we use. This has great implications for how infants are handled and spoken with and looked at and felt with. When you speak with an infant and young child, it is critical to look at their eye level, keeping a respectful distance to be sure they feel in control, and convey in all body language a calmness, interest, and willingness to follow the child's lead. Consider those ideas, by the way, with regard to the very act of holding and removing a child from a caregiver, and the changes in affect and gestures and movement that occur. Albert Morabian, a very well-known speech and language pathologist, helped us understand the power of nonverbal life and even preverbal life by looking at the aspects of communication, of interpersonal communication, that most convey the social meaning of an exchange. And he estimated that 55% of what occurs between two people, especially between adults and infants and young children, are related to facial expressions. 38% are intonation, and only 7% are the words. So 93% of what infants get conveyed to them about the social meaning of an event are nonverbal. This wonderful example taken from the work of Tiffany Field, Dr. Tiffany Field, a very well-known expert in the significance of touch, shows how remarkable it is that babies are uh, with their caregivers and with other adults. And so in these examples, a mother's mood can induce an emotional state in the infant that's mirroring and attuned to the parent. 
The infant brain is wired by these moment-to-moment -moment experiences. And when these experiences are regulated, attuned, responsive, consistent, and loving, the interconnections are formed in a very regulated, organized way. The period of birth to three actually represents our opportunity and even our obligation to form the human brain. Brain development is most rapid in the last trimester of pregnancy and the first three years of life. At birth, as we stated already, there are 80 to 100 billion neurons, but only 20% of those neurons are interconnected at birth. The remaining 80% will be wired in accord with the human interactions and experiences the infant and child encounter. Each of those neurons is capable of up to 10,000 synapses that are functional connections with other brain systems and regions, and 700 synapses can occur every second of the infant's life. So in this depiction, we imagine that as the interconnections are occurring, they are occurring in a coordinated, regulated way. But what happens when there is danger? or fright or fear. The amygdala, that small portion of the brain in the subcortex, activates a cascade of events within our nervous system to prepare the infant for flight or fight or freeze responses. This sympathetic nervous system response involves the amygdala and it then leads to a cascade where signals are sent to our master gland called the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland at the base of the brain. These in turn send hormones into the bloodstream and activates the adrenal glands to secrete adrenaline and other chemicals and neurotransmitters that flip the brain and body on and act for danger. This is good in the short run. This is bad when it is chronically on. It is erosive, depleting, and corrosive. This is known as the HPA axis or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. When the stress system that leads to fight or flight, reactions of fear, disorganization, and derailment, all brain systems are affected. Mental health is disturbed. Development and learning are adversely affected, sometimes for good. So the brain responds to all events as a whole and those parts of the brain that are involved in visual examination, in language learning, in focusing attention, in storing memories are all affected. So let's return to our wonderings about Child Protective Service intervention. Imagine that one day I came to your home and told you that you were moving to a new location. Imagine you were not permitted to take any food you had prepared, none of your clothing. You could not take any photographs of the people you knew and loved, no things with you, not even your pillow. Then suppose I moved you to a new place where your bed felt differently, the sun came into your room differently, the smell of the home was unfamiliar, the kinds of clothes, language, and facial expressions that people had were strange to you. Then suppose I moved you like that five times in one year. Then suppose I did all of this during the first year of life when you had no way to understand these changes nor language to express your confusion. This is what happens to many young infants when for their safety and protection they are removed from families who gave birth to them or cared for them. Yet we now know that infants from the first moments of life recognize those familiar smells and voices, can see and distinguish people, can show us through expressions and movements how they are doing and how we are doing with them. Such changes, even when they occur to protect the child from neglect, maltreatment, and danger, have adverse effects on a child. Infants are not too young to suffer, be changed, and be formed by these experiences. Even when parents and caregivers fail in their love and treatment, children form relationships with them. So what can we do? Well, some general considerations are to continually see this experience and understand it 
both psychologically and neurologically, through the eyes of the infant and child. One way to really approach this work is to redefine the role of those caregivers who will be caring for the child when out-of-home placement occurs, the resource family. And this may involve changes in how we recruit, tool, and support them. I will share with you some visitation and, f and resource family needs that can be considered. And I also believe that one of our best ways of helping is to begin to examine judicial and protective service models that are less rooted in litigious process and stressful courtroom encounters, such as the Safe Babies Court Team model that's now housed at Zero to Three, the National Center for Infants, Toddlers, and Families. Let me begin by first discussing a concept that is critical to addressing the unintended consequences, and that is promoting birth and family resource relationships. One way we can help children who undergo ch such changes in their relationships is to try our best to link those who cared for the child before the move with those who are now caring for the child. These connections help the child and all caregivers with the extreme pain and worry that can accompany such disruptions in attachments. Of course, when the child has been removed from the birth family, the pain to both is intensified. Both birth parent and foster family need support to talk with each other and to arrange thoughtful plans for ways to help the child that they learn that the adults in the child's life will bend over backwards to help promote security and love in the child. So for example, be sure that all families, birth and foster, call the child by the same name, follow the same care practices like eating and toileting, talk about and talk without judgment of, or criticism about each other. Allowing photographs of the birth and foster families in each other's home is critical. This can be quite difficult and may require much discussion and reassurances for both families. Creating life narratives and other representations that address not just the present but anticipate the future developmental needs and striving of children and their families. It is not easy being a foster parent to recognize that in cases where the placement is temporary, you must form a loving attachment with the knowledge that you may have to later say goodbye to the child you are caring for. Foster parents may also feel anger and resentment at a parent who has been neglectful or hurtful to their child. These feelings and beliefs need to be talked about with the persons who are helping you and the child. When they can be addressed, we can help the child feel less divided between relationships. This can really help all involved. Another area of intervention is transportation. We should consider the transportation around parenting time as part of our obligation to promote security and relationship building. Transportation for visits with the birth family must be done by the same transportation staff in the same vehicle as much as possible. Ideally, it is better for the child to be brought to and picked up for a visit by his foster family. It is so helpful for a child to see that both birth and foster mother, for example, can see each other, talk with each other, and even share information about the child, how he slept last night, what she ate today, or that she had a tummy ache last night and now feels better. These very activities are forming brain connections as each adult with the infant and child or engaged what neurologists call serve and return interactions with each other as they open and close these circles of communication, these back and forth interactive episodes. Both brain and emotional stress systems remain inactivated and neural circuits for security, self-regulation, and learning are strengthened. The initial intervention and removal can be very stressful and even humiliating, shame-based, and traumatizing. Let's consider what an initial investigation, intervention, and removal protocol, if needed, would look like. Let's consider first what happens. 
When children are placed in foster care, as we said, many unintended and undesirable consequences follow that adversely affect the child and their families. These, as we know, can weaken primary relationships and the prospects of reunification empirically become more unlikely. Children and parents often struggle to recover from separation and public intervention. These outcomes are linked to the usual ways that interventions occur surrounding child maltreatment and removal. What follows are the arduous and stressful practices of visitation, monitoring, litigation, and permanency decisions. What the research, however, does not address are better ways to intervene in the crises that precipitate a child's placement in foster care. We can examine and empirically assess whether or not intervention, removal, monitoring, litigation, and permanency decisions designed in accord with principles of infant parent mental health can lead to better outcomes. Based on these principles in the brain sciences, we can design an intervention protocol with the following components. Examine the current methods employed to investigate allegations, and when determined as necessary, removal of a child that would minimize shame and trauma to birth family and child are critical. This might involve a specialized team of protective service, therapeutic, and law enforcement when needed personnel. It might involve conducting immediate, within hours, visitation with the separated parent rather than the current practice of days, even weeks, before the separated child sees the parent from whom he or she was removed for the first time. Developmentally driven visitation, duration, and frequency rather than the current one hour every one or two weeks, whether a child is six months, six years, or 16 years old. Intensive work on birth mother, foster mother, other relationships so that the foster family fosters help in the child and birth family are critical. Intensive training and supervision of child protective service staff, police partners, and participating mental health partners will help this happen. A protocol can be developed to address these factors and a host of other factors that might reduce the parent's shame, public humiliation, and rage, and will make reunification more likely to occur and succeed, and this would make the goal of family preservation more likely to occur. Visitation in particular, also parenting time, must be re-examined. Visits must occur regularly, at least three times a week for an infant under 18 months, twice weekly up to age three, and once weekly thereafter, minimally. These practices require much planning and support, and birth and foster parents should talk with their child's caregivers and helpers to determine whether this can happen. So let me share with you two promising approaches that can go a long way to address these ideas regarding birth family, foster family relationships and creating effective visitation practices. This chart from the Michigan Association for Infant Mental Health provides guidelines for visitation. Parenting time must be sensitive to the developmental level of the child, support for the birth and resource families, and guided by the principles of infant and child mental health. For most infants, short, frequent visits are best to build relationships without overwhelming the infant with too much change in routine or environment. Infant and child mental health specialists can recommend specific plans for the frequency and duration of visits to promote security and growth in the child, adequacy in all of the caregivers, and to build relationships among all with the child. Visits which occur infrequently, inconsistently, and stressfully can present an illusion that visitation is not a good practice when in fact the data support the conclusion that how visits occur is the critical variable. An infant or toddler under age three who visits with his or her family for one or two hours a week, particularly under stressful conditions, will suffer greatly, as will the birth and resource families. No attachment can be sustained in infants and toddlers and young children with contact limited to 50 to 100 hours a year. 
So what should effective visits look like? Firstly, expanding the role of the foster parent to bridge the gap between foster and birth families has been a long-time initiative of the Casey Foundation, for example, in their Family to Family initiative. The foster parent can be seen and help to be a mentor to the birth parents of infants. And in California, in conjunction with the National Abandoned Infant Assistance Center, shared family care is the ruling concept. The state of Pennsylvania reported that effective visitation resulted in increased support of the parent-child attachment, a reduced sense of abandonment for the child while in care, an enhanced sense of well-being of the child. The frequency of visiting the child in placement was associated with change for the better in parental feelings towards the placement and also with less time in placement. And written visiting plans correlated with increased frequency of visits and reunification. The elements contained in this presentation slide suggest how these things can happen structuring visits to enhance opportunities for parents to practice their caregiving skills with the foster family, using the homes of foster families at times that might include increasingly challenging situations, such as mealtimes and bedtimes, including activities that the parent can be part of to, to ensure that they are part of their lives, school activities and meetings, doctor's appointments, recreational activities, and encouraging relationship building between the parents who care for the child. Dr. Marty Beyer developed a model called visit coaching to support parenting time for children in and out of home placements. She noted, although research correlates visits with return home and shorter foster care placement, in most child welfare systems, visits are rarely more than an encounter in an office. Families can have okay visits for months and be no closer to demonstrating that they can keep their children safe. In current child welfare practice, visits typically do not build on a parent's strengths or guide improved parenting. Visit coaching is an intervention designed to promote security and strengthen families guided by these principles. Empowerment. Visits should be a celebration of the family. Pictures, stories, activities. The activities and the atmosphere should be as home-like as possible. Empathy. From the child's point of view, the family and those who are coaching the family and foster family must agree on the child's specific needs to be met in the visit. At least one of those specific needs that are met during the visit needs to be connected to the very reasons the child was removed from the home. Responsiveness. Visits need to be anger-free zones, depression-free zones. Families are coached to know the developmental expectations for the age and to learn stimulation that fits for that age. Separate time is made available for discussions with the caseworker, the foster mother, etc., so that the parent can concentrate on the visits. Active parenting. Parents should be able to feel and be in charge during visits. The coach tries to improve the fit between the child's temperament and the parent's behavior and attributions. Visit coaching is a purposeful program with a plan that is designed by caseworkers, therapists, parents, foster parents, and a coach. This is a plan for the visits designed to continue and enhance the parent-child relationship. Parents do a self-assessment after each visit based upon those goals. Surveillance makes sure that nothing bad happens during the visit. But purposeful visits are visits that are enjoyable for the child and family and growthful along some identified need of the child, family, and or the child and family. Children must experience the parents and foster parents as communicating in a friendly manner. Leavings and separations are supposed to be difficult. It is a time of heightened emotion that both the birth and foster families need to be helped to handle. And so having visits with birth and foster families where there might be games, toys, snacks, and other activities are wonderful. Abuse trauma 
substance use can all damage the parent's antenna, resulting in the parent failing to see a child's need or putting their own desperation ahead of their child's need. Playing with a child increases the parent's awareness of how bright they are, how curious, and what they like to do. Visit coaching, by the way, is not therapy, but it's an awareness of how relationships work. With younger children, one of the overarching goals is to enhance attachment with parents who sometimes, through no fault of their own, have pre-existing difficulties with attachment themselves. The coach helps them to avoid overstimulating their young children, as well as to avoid understimulating them. Simple directions from the coach, such as imitate everything your baby does, or do everything you can to keep your baby's attention, help in this regard. These attunement, misattunement, repair episodes are critically important to both emotional development and brain wiring. And in fact, infant massage is a wonderful adjunct to promoting the infant-parent relationship and helping parents discern better ways of attuning to their child. The principal components of visit coaching are listed here. Proper preparation for the visit, reflecting on how it went and making supportive changes for the next time. The frequency and durations of visits, as we noted earlier, must be based on the developmental and emotional needs of the infant, toddler, or child, and must support both the birth and foster families. Ideally, the coach would be able to schedule a location for the visit that corresponds to the child's needs and or, or the goal being addressed in visitation. The visits must be related to actual parenting interactions, such as mealtime or bedtime, as we said earlier, school visits, playground time, reading, and all the many things that parents can do to engage their infants and young children. Accordingly, visits should be focused on the very challenges that led to removal. So for example, if a parent became rageful at the behavior of their preschool age child around his or her screaming or inconsolable crying related to be told he could not play with a toy, the visits should occur where that kind of event may occur again. Dr. Mary Dozier and her team at the University of Delaware have been developing and researching the remarkable effectiveness of approaches that support the work of the foster resource families. The approach, attachment and biobehavioral catch-up, have been empirically effective in meeting essential goals that enhance the emotionally and developmentally needed care of the child in out-of-home placement and reduce the unintended consequences of intervention. Infants in foster care often fail to elicit caregiving responses from their caregivers by pushing them away or by being inconsolable. Some caregivers do not respond with nurturance when infants are in distress or under stress due to their personal history. Young children in care are often dysregulated physiologically, emotionally, and or behaviorally, providing a predictable environment filled with routines help with this. The goals of attachment and biobehavioral catch-up are including support of the foster parent to provide nurturance even when it's not elicited. This is often helped by the use of videotapes that display babies directly eliciting care and babies that fail to do so. Helping foster parents to reinterpret the foster baby signals and helping them to be more in touch with their own reactions to their foster baby signals is critical. This is important as infants who have been neglected or maltreated may be unable to communicate their needs or may display unfavorable behaviors and emotions that reflect their own level of poor self-regulation, stress, and disorganization. These can elicit angry reactions in a caregiver who interprets the behaviors as intentional and hurtful. So, foster families are helped to follow the child's lead when not distressed and take the lead when the child is distressed. These interactive episodes, what we've referred to as serve and return, or opening and closing circles of communication, 
involve co-regulation, mutuality and reciprocity, gestural, emotional, vocal and verbal exchanges that are the very building blocks for psychological and neurological foundations for healthy intellectual, emotional development and learning. Families are encouraged to let the child be in charge of some interactions and are helped to learn how to read the child's signals for engagement and re-engagement. Caregivers are even helped to understand their own comfort levels in providing nurturance and how this can affect their responsiveness to the infant. These researchers, in fact, use the shark music from the movie Jaws to represent the caregivers' own internal material from their own lives and growing up that can be activated internally by the children when they are caring for the child. Caregivers learn the significance of touch, in parenting a child and they help the child learn how to experience and express the full range of human emotions without being reactive or dysregulated. Finally, there are emerging models to create a judicial response to infants, children, and families in protective service intervention. And these two also aim to reduce the unintended consequences of intervention. One significant model, rooted in the work of Judge Cindy Lederman, Dr. Julia Sosky, and Dr. Lynn Katz in Miami-Dade County, has become part of a national model at zero to three, the National Center for Infants, Toddlers, and Families. Now known as the Safe Babies Court Team Project, it is currently being implemented in five states. This model addresses the triple threat that occurs to the child's development when they are involved in neglect and abuse situations. The first is the trauma that follows from the ne neglect and abuse itself. The second is the experience of separation, loss, and lack of a secure base despite a safe placement, and that we have been touching on throughout this presentation. And the third consequence is the experience the child may have of feeling lost. The child's unique needs are not addressed efficiently by the systems in place. Many children who are referred to the child welfare system for reasons of maltreatment suffer from these tri this triple threat and ongoing separations and continuing suboptimal attachment relationships can continue to threaten the young child's future development. The system malfunction fails to hold the child in mind and fails to see the world through the eyes of the child. So this model focuses on promoting attachment by training, assessment, treatment, court proceedings, and placement decisions done by a team under judicial leadership. And the purpose is not simply to enhance and protect physical safety, but psychological well-being as well. So the court teams are a model to reduce the recurrence of abuse and neglect, engage judicial leadership with child development experts and child welfare protective experts, and to really directly address, address the co-occurrence of those three uh, triple threats. The Safe Babies Court Team project incorporates a number of the strategies that, that have been reviewed in this presentation and offers a promising approach to reduce the unintended consequences of child service intervention. So this webinar has offered a view from the fields of infant child mental health and the neurosciences that calls for a series of changes that are needed to address the unintended consequences of intervention. In the end, all those involved must bend over backwards to ensure that the entire process is guided by what it does and what it means through the eyes of the child.